Let's pray together. Our great God and Savior forever, forever, you are lifted high. Lord God, you and you alone are infinitely victorious and infinitely happy. Your beautiful perfections in all your triune life give you perfect joy forever and ever. And God, our great end in this life is to know you and enjoy you forever. So my one request is that now in this moment of the preaching of your word, may I and all those who are with me give up on the passing pleasures and vain glories of sin. And may we find infinite glory and unbreakable joy in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. We sing with joy of Christ's resurrection and his victory over the grave and that we're secure in him forever. And actually, it's my joy this morning to preach the best news in the world, which is the work of Jesus Christ, his life and his death on the cross in our place and his burial and his triumphant resurrection and his ascension from which place now he reigns and gives the church everything she needs for all of life and godliness and the promise of his soon return. It is my great joy to preach the work of Jesus Christ. And when I or anybody who loves you preaches the work of Jesus Christ to you, we are, we're dealing with something that goes beyond our ability to deal with it. The paradox is that it's the most important thing to teach about. But the facets of it and the realities of it overspill our human language and even our logical capacity to express it all. It's so good that we want to preach it all the time, but the sort of paradox is that it is too good for our containers of lessons and words and, and sermons and that it always has to spill over that. So the work of Christ is something that we can apprehend and believe together. We can get a handle on it, but the work of Christ is not something that you and I will ever comprehend and pick up the whole thing and understand it. It's beyond our minds and even our hearts. When we talk about Christ's work on the cross, even in 1 Peter, we'll be in 1 Peter 3.18 today, even in Peter, he, 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 he expresses the paradox that a couple of times in this epistle, he says, hey, the, the theme here is suffering. And just like Christ suffered on the cross, church, you will be called to suffer like Christ did. So there's a, a part of Christ's work that we really can imitate. And yet Peter in the very same epistle, sometimes in the next paragraph or two, he'll say, hey, hold on. There is an element of what Christ did on the cross that is utterly and totally glorious and unique that no one can ever reduplicate or imitate ever. And both of those things are true because we're talking about the work of Christ. It's so good. And we'll talk about the work of Christ in 1 Peter 3, and I'd kind of like to go through verse 18, almost phrase by phrase. So 1 Peter 3, we'll read 18 down through verse 22. And what you're gonna find is that the waters get a little choppy in verses 19 and 20 and 21. When you go to Bible school or you take a Bible interpretation class, the folks who are in the know will tell you that 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20 and 21 is one of the most difficult passages in the New Testament to interpret rightly. That's why we're gonna skip it this morning. <laughs> My plan is, Lord willing, to come back to it next week. But I want to do verse 19 and actually verse 22 this week because the main point of this passage is more important than the sort of sticky details and the main point is crystal clear and not difficult to interpret at all. So I want to give you the whole thing today and then Lord willing, I'll walk you through the difficult phrases in 19 through 21 next week. 1 Peter 3 verse 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins the righteous for the unrighteous, 
that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, verse 22, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and powers having been subjected to him and forever, like we just sang, forever, he is glorified victoriously in heaven. So let's look this morning at the big picture here and we'll cover, like I said, verses 18, verses 18 and 22. Let's tackle verse 18, and it is so good that it's worth tackling almost phrase by phrase. It says, for Christ also suffered once, once, once. What does that mean? It means not repeatedly, like the lambs and the sacrifices in the Old Testament had to be repeated time after time after time after time. Christ suffered once and his suffering will never be repeated. A lot of things in life get repeated. You came to church last week. Hopefully you're here today with a good attitude. You, you, you come to church week after week after week. We like to watch football around here. It's not that there's one football game and then football's over. The games are repeated. My alma mater, University of Southern California, had a football game yesterday with a team that plays around here somewhere. And uh, my, I love Wisconsin with all my heart, but your alma mater is always your alma mater, and my team won. Well, it's going to happen again, and then my team's going to lose. Things are repeated time and time and time and time again. But this says that Christ's sacrifice was once for all. Romans 6, verse 20, the death he, Romans 6, verse 10, the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Turn one book back, if you would, to Hebrews, because Hebrews is maybe the the best place in the New Testament that talks about the singular nature of Christ's death. Hebrews 7, verse 27 says, Hebrews 7, verse 27 says, Christ has no need like those high priests, I'm in 727, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sin and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. And then two chapters later in Hebrews 9, verse 26, Hebrews 9 and verse 26, it says that if Christ was a normal high priest, he would have had to do it more than once. It says in verse 26 of Hebrews 9, he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as he is appointed, as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Christ's sacrifice was once for all, and it's completed. We don't fill it out. We don't repeat it when we celebrate communion or when someone is baptized. These are all ways that we remember that it is finished. Christ's work is complete. Well, the next little phrase in trying to unpack the absolutely unpackable and, and, and the work of Christ that, that, that carries through all of our packages and categories and b- spills over their shores, the next phrase from verse 18 of 1 Peter 3 is, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Christ suffered for sins, the righteous in the place of the unrighteous. The theological word for this, it's two words, is substitutionary atonement. Substitution, you get that, and atonement, the paying of a satisfactory price. The theological category for this is substitutionary atonement. The sort of simple way of saying it in four very crisp words that a six-year-old would understand is Jesus 
in my place. Jesus in my place. That's it. The language comes from Leviticus, from the Old Testament where the sin was a a burden that brought death. And even the the worshiper, it says in Leviticus 4 and Leviticus 5, would, would place his hand on the head of the lamb as if he were, as if the weight of his sin was going to the sacrifice instead of to him. And then the sacrifice was killed in my place. In Isaiah chapter 53, verses five and six, you know these verses? He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him, the chastisement that brought us peace, by his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one of us to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus in my place. We just completed a membership class. We prayed about that in our congregational prayer. There's another membership class coming up. When when you become a member of Racine Bible Church, this, it's not as intimidating as it sounds. You have, a, you have an interview with one of our pastors or elders, and it's a simple interview. We get to know you. We say, we say, do you have any questions we can help answer, any needs we can help meet? And one question that I often ask in that interview is I just ask the new member, uh, the question is, could you, could you tell me the gospel? to which the new member says, you're the pastor of this church and you don't know the gospel? No, no, it's not that I need to, like, I say, can you tell me the gospel or, or, or uh, how do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? And um, it, is, it is sometimes the case that in those very membership interviews, the, the person who's becoming a member will say something like, well, I go to church faithfully and I try to do more good than bad. And that's the wrong answer, but I'm glad that the wrong answer comes out in conversation with me so we can talk about that. That's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. This, 1 Peter 3, 18 is the gospel. The Lord has caught, the Lord, the, the Lord, the righteous one in the place of the unrighteous. So the way to answer that question, how you know you're going to heaven, is that Jesus died in my place. And that because that made atonement and satisfied all of my needs, he has risen again from the grave. And all of my hope for heaven is in him. And so he says in 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. The righteous connects with the, part, with the pronoun he. The unrighteous connects with us. We are the unrighteous. The character of the sufferer and the character of those for whom he suffered could not be more antithetical. Beloved, this is why grace is so amazing. Done to say somewhere, yeah, if someone's really good and, and they're a great friend, then perhaps you'd lay down your life for them. But Jesus loved us in this while we were his enemies. He died for us. We weren't just sort of unwittingly trapped in unrighteousness. We were drinking it down by the gallon and bathing in the lasciviousness of it. And that's when he came to rescue us. The righteous for the unrighteous. I've never in my wildest dreams thought that the quote-unquote Calvinistic doctrine of total depravity makes people depressed and bad. The, the, The more we own our own sinfulness, the freer and happier and more joyous we become because the righteous died for the unrighteous. That's why. That's what makes grace so amazing. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Peter's reiterating what he said in 1 Peter 2, 21. 
In 1 Peter 2, 21, it says, to this you've been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was there sin in his mouth when he was reviled. He didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on that tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Church, this is the heart of it all, isn't it? D.L. Moody, who, for, for founding a, a huge church in a college, um, for doing all of that, he was a pretty simple guy. If you listen to his preaching, it's pretty simple. And one of D.L. Moody's most famous lines that he often repeated was, I must die or I must find someone who is willing to die for me. And if the Bible doesn't teach me how to do that, it doesn't teach me anything. That's the core of what we're talking about. That's at the heart of it all. Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. I love that. That he might bring us to God. The purpose of Christ's suffering was so that he could bring you, you, you to God. This is a rather unique way of talking about it. Dozens and dozens of times in the New Testament, it says the purpose of Christ's suffering was forgiveness, salvation, uh, there are three or four ways that it's almost always talked about. It's very rarely talked about in this way and with these phrases that he suffered so that he might bring us to God. The gap between us and God was too far for us to travel. We needed someone to let us in their car so to speak, and drive us there. He came to bring us to God. There's a, I don't know if you know the name Rich Mullins. He's, he was a Christian singer. He's in heaven now. But he released an album, The Year. Okay, here's one for you. He released an album, The Year That I Got My Driver's License. What year do you think that was? If you say, if you say 1990 something, I love you. If you say 1960-something, you need to find another church because that's an insult to your pastor. But uh, I spent all of my teenage years in the 1980s, and to this day, my adult children envy me that I got to be a teenager in the 80s, the best time to be a teenager. It was 1986 that he released this album, and uh, I don't know, there's lots of lines from that album that stick in my mind. You know how it is, whatever music you listen to when you were a junior in high school, but the line that I, I always find myself going back to it in my mind is he just sings in there, uh, on the road to salvation, I stick out my thumb and he gives me a ride. It's the only way it's gonna work. I can't get there. My legs aren't powerful enough. I can't afford a set of wheels. I cannot get from here to there. The only way to do it is like a bum to stick out my thumb and that Jesus would come and get me and carry me there. Amen. That's the gospel. And that's why it says that he died in order that he might bring us to God. What a wonderful truth. And then you see what it says? Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. What does that mean? Well, it's important to say that because if it just said being put to death, I can't imagine this, how heretical it would be if it just said being put to death and that death utterly destroyed him, period, end of sentence, end of epistle. You see, he has to say this because though he was put to death, real cold stone death, that death did not ultimately destroy him because he was made alive again. The resurrection. Notice it's passive in both cases. He was put to death 
and he was made alive. He was put to death by the, the wrath of the Roman rulers and the Jews and even by the, the so to speak, the, the, the will and the act of his father. And yet, he was also brought to life. The reason that has to be passive is for the obvious reasons that, the obvious reason that if you're dead, how do you have the energy to bring yourself back to life? So the Bible says that, that, the, that the Holy Spirit of God brought the resurrection to be. And when Peter says he was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, he, he's not so much contrasting that Jesus had a fleshly material body and an immaterial spirit. Like, he's not so much talking about uh, two natures that commingle inside of Christ. Peter's talking about two ways of living, two modes of existence, two ways to be alive. You can be alive in the flesh, in which is life, but it is life that is guaranteed to end, or you can be alive in the spirit, which is life that can never end. Jesus Christ now lives a regenerated new life, alive to God, alive in the realm of the spirit forevermore. And the eternal life that Jesus has is the eternal life that he shares with us. Suffering and salvation. Jesus suffered and all who follow him will in some ways likewise suffer. But Jesus has eternal life and all who follow him will enjoy the salvation of eternal life forever. The contrast put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit fits with the contrast that the whole epistle of 1 Peter makes, which is that the suffering in this life hurts, but the suffering in this life is short. The ninth hour on the cross and then his suffering ended. The suffering in this life is hard, but the suffering in this life is short. The spiritual blessing of salvation goes on forever and forever. Part of, part of Peter's burden Honestly, it's my burden when I talk with you all the time. My burden, I share it with Peter, is to somehow get you to remember the shortness of this earthly life and the reality of the life to come. Because whenever we're in times of suffering or times of transition or times of challenge, we let the immediate overshadow the ultimate. And we let the vapor seem as if it is more important than eternity to eternity. And so Peter keeps bringing us back to the reality that the life we have in Jesus Christ is real life that lasts forever, that can never be taken from us. Perhaps it's the most important thing that you'll hear this morning just to hear me say again, the spiritual realm is not the weird uh, um, unimaginable and transient one. It's not that way. Spiritual life is real life, real life that cannot be taken from you and that will last forever. It is your current existence in a body that can get cancer or can get into an automobile accident that is short. The death that Jesus Christ died in the flesh led to life in the spirit that is joy forever that he now shares with us. So we could wrap up everything we've said about verse 18 with this sort of point of application. If we suffer for Christ, we can know that he suffered more for us. If we suffer for Christ, we can know that he suffered more for us. Our vision of making and training disciples who make and train disciples, the core of that mission is the declaration and demonstration of the gospel. And so again and again, we return to the cross, just as Peter again and again returns to the cross and says the righteous for the unrighteous. We're going to, Lord willing, interpret verses 19 and 20 and 21 next week but to see verse 22 that says now because of the resurrection 
Last phrase in verse 21, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers being subjected to him. It is unthinkable to have one without the other. If you're a member in good standing here, you would probably agree with me. It is unthinkable to have Kringle without, without coffee. <laughs> Who would have Mountain Dew with their Kringle? You are a strange little bird if you do that. Like, what is that? It's unthinkable to have one without the other at the risk of going to the sublime after the ridiculous. It is unthinkable to have the crucifixion without the resurrection. Utterly, utterly unthinkable. How could the righteous be actually defeated by the unrighteous? He couldn't. He couldn't. It is unthinkable to have the crucifixion without the resurrection because the resurrection was the divine declaration of satisfaction with the atonement that was made. The resurrection is the announcement, and he kind of talks about this in 19 and 21. The resurrection is the announcement to the demonic realms below the earth and every nation, tribe, and tongue on the earth and even the rulers and principalities above the earth that Jesus Christ wins. And that's why it says that triumphantly he's gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God and all things are subjected to him. So Christ's life as a righteous one led to his death and crucifixion in, in the place of the unrighteous. And his crucifixion led to the resurrection for us and for our salvation. And the resurrection, verse 22, leads to the ascension, where now every, every throne and power and principality is subjected to him. We are incorporated into each one of those facets. We talk so much about the, that little preposition in Christ, in Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ? It means that I'm incorporated into his death. And my, 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 my sins really were laid upon the head of the lamb when he took those thorns. And it means that I really am incorporated into his resurrection. And the life that I now live, I live in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And I really am incorporated in his ascension. As the high priest took the names on his, on his breastplate, he took my name into heaven. He took our human nature into unfallen into heaven and, and we have a place there. We have a forerunner there. We are incorporated into each aspect of his work. That's why we never tire of speaking of the person and work of Jesus Christ because that makes us who we are. This theme, you can call it Christ's ascension, you can call it Christ's uh, enthronement at the right hand of God. The old writers called it Christ's session, which just means that now, now he's seated and ruling over the universe. It is very often mentioned in the New Testament. The ascension and the seating and ruling of Jesus Christ is mentioned prophetically in the Gospels. It's mentioned celebratorily in the book of Acts and it's narrated even when he goes up to heaven and then it's in so many of the epistles. It's in Romans chapter eight, it's in Colossians chapter three, it's all over the book of Hebrews and it's foretold most gloriously in the Old Testament passage that is the single most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament. Some of you Bible nerds know what that passage is. It's Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is about the ascension and the rule of Jesus Christ after his resurrection. And that's the single most referred to passage from the Old Testament in the New Testament. Christ's ultimate victory and authority, you see how verse 22 ends? Authorities and powers have been subjected unto him. Our mission and vision as a church is making and training disciples who make and train disciples. We get that making disciples from Matthew 28. And the controlling entry point of Matthew 28 before Jesus says, hey guys, and he does say this to us, hey guys, be a church that makes and trains disciples who makes and trains disciples. Jesus really does say that to us. But the controlling point before that is when Jesus says what? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, 
be a church that makes and trains disciples. Who makes and trains disciples? It all hinges on that. Christ's dominion over all things is portrayed as a present reality, though it is also the case that his reign over all things will be, uh, so to speak, actualized and we'll see it when those events told in, in First and Second Thessalonians and Revelation come to pass on this earth. But Christ's ultimate victory and sovereignty and authority is real and it is the most precious assurance for us that we could possibly have. Peter is writing to believers who are gonna suffer. He's writing to believers who might get arrested because of their faith. They'll lose their money. They'll lose their job. They'll lose their liberty. And as Peter writes to afflicted believers, what he says to those who are about to suffer is, I don't want you to be surprised. You really are gonna suffer. And I don't want you to forget that you are winning and you shall win in the end. You'll never lose, never lose. Not if you're on Christ's side. Not if you're on Christ's side. All authority in heaven and earth is subject to Christ. One of my favorite titles for Christ comes out of Revelation 1, verse 18. Christ says in Revelation 1, verse 18, listen to Jesus. He says, I died. And behold, I am alive forevermore, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. It's, it's a little bit of what he's getting at there when he says he went down and spoke to the spirits in prison. Uh, we'll, we'll maybe interpret it next week, but I'm telling you, it, it's not saying that Christ was captive in hell. What it is saying is he flew down there and ransacked the place because everything belongs to him. And he has the keys of death and hell. And this is why, like, I, 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 had, I had a chance this week to, to talk to one of my neighbors who I, I don't, I don't know, he's a God-fearer, but I don't know that he's born again yet. Like, you, you get chances to talk to people. And if they are afraid of death, you know, Jesus holds the key of death. What, you say, what I say to my friend is, you know, you're not wrong to be afraid of death. Death is a, the grave is a, is a place that you go and you can't get out. It's locked from outside and nobody has the power to break through that lock. I don't and you don't. And so you're not wrong to be afraid of death. But one has come who holds the keys of death and hell and no one will snatch those keys from him and he liberates those who bow the knee to his lordship. Will you come to him for life? And this is what Peter is getting at. Even right there in, in verse 22, he's saying we win. We will not be defeated. I think sometimes I get the Sundays mixed up. I think it was last Sunday that we sang together, um, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. And then we said, we should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. We have hope and we have confidence because Christ has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, powers being subject to him. This is our hope that we win in the end. There's a verse that, um, I don't know, there's like a little, a little stack of verses somewhere in my uh, cerebral cortex that's just sort of, when I'm walking from the chair up those little steps to the pulpit, there's like, I don't know, like maybe six or eight that, that I'm always thinking about. And, and one of them is Psalm 149. It says, let the godly exult in glory and sing for joy. And let them have the high praises of God in their throat and the two-edged sword in their hand and let them march to victory for the Lord. We, we, don't, we don't lose, not in Christ. Yeah, I could lose, my, my, uh, I could lose my, my liberty if they take me to jail. I could lose my money if they take it, but they, they, they can't hurt me. They can't cause me to be defeated if I'm in Christ. So doesn't it all come back to this? Where is your hope? Where is your hope? And where is your happiness? If your hope and happiness is having material provision, 
Then, if a hurricane comes and wipes out your house and you don't have the right kind of insurance, or if the government says, if you proclaim the truth of Jesus, we will take away all your assets, then if that's where your hope is, your hope is reachable and takeable and losable. But if your hope is in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ has already come out of the backside of the grave and he holds the keys to death and hell and every authority, every vice president, every president, every UN council is subject to him, then your hope can never be threatened or taken away. Which will it be? Which will it be? Place all of your hope in Jesus Christ. If we could summarize what we're, we see in verse 22 with one simple point of application, it's this. If we suffer for Christ, we know that we will have more glory forever with Christ than we ever had of suffering. If we suffer for Christ, we know that we will have more glory forever with Christ than we ever had of suffering with Christ or for Christ in this little lifetime. Where's your hope? Where's your joy? Would you, with me, place it all in the resurrection and ascension and authoritative hands of the Lord Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, hear your children as we pray to you and give us confidence Give us courage and give us joy. Heavenly Father, we confess that sometimes we seem or feel defeated when we should not be. We confess that sometimes the fear of man makes us swallow our words which would declare the goodness of God. And we ask that you would give us more courage and more confidence in the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray that we would anchor all of our hope now and forever in you. Lord Jesus, we rejoice that all things are subject to you and that in a very special way, you have made the church the apple of your eye, the place where you will exercise your headship and your husbandly love for us. We rejoice that we are yours and we place all of our confidence afresh and anew in you in this hour. Jesus, be glorified in the life of your church. Amen.